The Darkest Page Podcast presents Mary Eleanor Wilkins Freeman's The Jade Bracelet. Lawrence Everts was on his way home from his law office in Somerset when he caught sight of the inexplicable circle in the snow. The snow was hard and smooth, and the circle immediately arrested his attention. It was just outside the compact snow of the sidewalk, in what would have been the gutter had there been any gutters in Somerset. Lawrence carried a neatly folded umbrella. He was exceedingly punctilious in all his personal habits. It had threatened snow earlier in the day, although now the sky was brilliantly clear and the stars were shining out, one by one, in the ineffable rose, violet and yellow tints of the horizon. Lawrence poked with the steel point of his umbrella at the circle and struck something hard. He endeavoured to lift whatever it was with the umbrella point, but was unable to do so. Then, frowning a little, he removed his English glove, plunged his hand into the snow, and drew it up again with the jade bracelet. It was beautiful cabbage green jade, cut out of the solid stone and very large. A man's bracelet, and rather large for his own hand. Everts had a small hand. He stood staring at it. He immediately remembered having seen somewhere, in a Chinese laundry, a Chinaman wearing a bracelet of a similar design. But there was no Chinese laundry in Somerset. He could not remember that there was one in Lloyd's, which was the only other village for miles large enough to support a laundry. Once the Chinaman had penetrated to Somerset, but the hoodlum element, which was large and flourishing, had routed him out. He had disappeared, presumably for more peaceable fields of cleanliness, although there had been dark rumours which had died away, both for lack of substantiation and of interest in the uncanny heathen, as most of the citizens adjudged him. Lawrence stood gazing at the thing with wonder. Then, obeying some unaccountable impulse, he slipped it over his right hand, the one from which he had removed the glove. Immediately the horror was upon him. He realised, although fighting hard against realisation, that there was another hand beside his own in the jade bracelet. He gave his hand a sharp jerk to rid himself of the sensation, but it remained. He could feel the other hand and wrist, although he could see absolutely nothing. Only his sense of touch was reached, and one other, his sense of smell. Overpowering the clear, frosty atmosphere came the strange pungency of opium and sandalwood. But worse than the uncanny assailing of the senses, far worse was something else. Into his clear, western mind, trained from infancy to logically inferences, Christian belief, and right estimates of things, stole something foreign and antagonistic. Strange memories, strange outlooks seemed misting over his own familiar ones as smoke mists a window. Everts snatched the bracelet from his wrist and gave it a fling back into the snow. Then something worse happened. He still had the feeling of the thing on his wrist, but the pull of the other hand and wrist became stronger. He fairly choked with the opium smoke and the strange cloud dimmed his own personality with greater force. He drew on his glove, but unmistakably would not go on over the invisible bracelet. What the devil? Everett said quite aloud. He could see in the snow, the clearly cut circle where the bracelet had fallen. He withdrew his glove, picking up the thing again, put it on and walked along, shaking the snow from his hand. It was unmistakably better on than off. The strange sensations were not so pronounced. Still, it was bad enough in all conscience. Presently, he walked along. Everts met a friend who stared at him after he had said good evening. What is the matter? Are you ill? He asked, turning back. No, replied Everts shortly. You look like the deuce, his friend remarked wonderingly. Everts was conscious that the man stood still a moment staring at him, but he did not turn. He walked on, feeling as if he were in handcuffs with the devil. It became more and more horrible. When he reached his boarding house, he went straight to his room and did not go down to dinner. No one came to ask why he did not, 
he had not any intimates in the house and indeed was one who was apt to keep himself to himself, regulate his own actions and resent questions concerning them. He turned on his electric light and tried to write a letter. He was able to do that as far as the mere mechanical action was concerned. The other hand moved in accordance with his. But what he wrote? Evert stared incredulously at the end of the first page. What he had written was in a language unfamiliar to him, both in words and characters. And yet the meaning was horribly clear. He could not conceive of the possibility of his writing things of such hideous significance, and, moreover, of a significance hitherto unknown to him. He tore up the sheet and threw it into the waste paper basket. Then he lit his pipe and tried to smoke, but the scent of opium came into his nostrils instead of tobacco. He flung his pipe aside and took up the evening paper, but to his horror he read in a twofold fashion, as one may see double. There were horrors enough, as usual, but there were horrors besides which dimmed them. He tossed the paper to the floor and sat for a few moments looking about him. He had rather luxurious apartments, a large sitting room, bedroom and bath, and he gathered together some choice things in the way of furniture and bric-a-brac. He had rather a leaning toward oriental treasures, and there were some good things in the way of Persian rugs and hangings. Just before his chair was a fine prayer rug, with its graceful triangle which should point towards the holy city. Suddenly he seemed to see, not a Muslim, but a small figure in a richly wrought robe, with a long slimy braid, and before it sat a squat, grinning bronze god. That was too much. Good God! Everts muttered to himself and sprang up. He got his coat and hat, put them on hurriedly and rushed out of the room in the house, all the time with the never-ceasing sensation of the other hand and wrist in the jade bracelet. He hurried down the street until he reached the office of a physician, a friend of his, perhaps the closest he had in Somerset. There was a light in the office and Everts entered without ceremony. Dr. Van Brunt was alone. He had just finished his dinner and was having his usual smoke, leaning back luxuriously in a very old Morris chair, well worn to all the needs of his figure. He was a short man, heavily blonde bearded. Thank God I smell tobacco instead of that cursed other thing, was Everts' first salutation. Van Brunt looked at him, then he jumped up with heavy alacrity. For heaven's sake, what's to pay, old man? He said. The devil, I rather guess, answered Everts, settling himself in a forlorn hunch on the nearest chair. Dr. Van Brunt remained standing, looking at him with consternation. You look like the devil, he remarked finally. I feel like him, I reckon, responds Everts gloomily. Now that he was there, he shrank from confidence. He felt a decided tug at his wrist and hardly seemed to realise himself at all because of the cloud of another personality before his mental vision. Dr. Van Brunt stood before him, scowling with perplexity, his fuming pipe in hand. Then he said suddenly, What in thunder is that thing you've got on your wrist? Some token from hell, I begin to think, answered Everts. Where did you get it? I found it in the snow near the corner of State Street and I was fool enough to put the infernal thing on. Why on earth don't you take it off if it bothers you? I've tried it, and the second state is worse than the first. Look here. What is it? You know I never drink, except an occasional glass of wine at a dinner, and an occasional pint of beer, mostly to keep you company. Well, of course I do. What? You know I am not in any sense a drinking man. Of course I know it. Why? Why? Everts faced him fiercely. Why then do I see things that nobody except men who have sold their souls and wits for drink see? You don't? Yes, I do. I must be mad. For God's sake, Van Brunt, tell me if I am mad, and do something for me if you can. Van Brunt sat down again in his chair and took a whiff of his pipe, but he did not remove his great blue eyes from Everts. Mad? Nothing, he said. Don't you suppose I know a maniac when I see him? What on earth are you ranting about anyway? And what is it about that green thing on your arm? And why don't you take it off? I tell you I am in the innermost circles of hell when it is off, cried Everts. What made you put the thing on anyway? I don't know. My evil angel, I reckon. Dr. Van Brunt leaned forward and looked closely at the jade bracelet. It is a fine specimen, he said. 
I have never seen anything like it, except... He hesitated a moment, and was evidently endeavouring to recall something. I know where I saw one like it, he said suddenly. That poor devil of a Chinaman who started a laundry here five years ago, and was routed out of town, had its facsimile. I remember noticing it one day, just before he was run out. Don't you remember? I don't know what I remember, replied Everts. He jerked the bracelet angrily as he spoke, then gave a great start of horror for the invisible thing which he felt had seemed to come closer at the jerk. Why on earth don't you take that thing off? asked Van Brunt again. He continued to smoke and to watch his friend closely. Didn't I tell you it was worse off than on? Then he gets so close. Ugh. He? Who? Don't ask me. How do I know? The devil, I think, or one of his friends. Rot. It's so. Sit down, Everts, and have a pipe, and put that nonsense out of your head. Put it out of my head, repeated Everts bitterly. Suddenly, a thought struck him. See here, you don't believe that I'm talking rationally, he said. I think something has happened to upset you, replied Van Brunt guardedly. I see. Well, try the thing yourself. Everts, as he spoke, withdrew the bracelet with a jerk. He paled perceptibly as he did so, and set his mouth hard, as if with pain or disgust. He extended the shining green circle towards Van Brunt, who took it, laughing, although there was an anxious gleam in his eyes. Van Brunt, oddly enough, since he was a large man, had small hands. The bracelet slipped on his wrist as easily as it had done on Everts. He sat quite still for a second. He gave one more puff at his pipe, then he laid it on the table. His great blonde face changed. He looked at Everts. What is this infernal thing anyhow? He said. Don't ask me. I am as wise as yourself, but now you know what torment I'm in. Everts spoke with a feeble triumph. You don't mean you feel it without the bracelet. Try it. Van Brunt took off the bracelet and laid it on the table beside his pipe. His face contracted. My God, he ejaculated. Now you know. Good Lord, I remember devilish things which never happened. Am I? I am going backwards like a crab. Everts nodded. You mean you feel the same thing, don't I? As if some infernal thing was handcuffed to you. Everts nodded. Well, said Van Brunt slowly, I do not think I believed in much of anything, but now I believe in the devil. He took up the bracelet. Everts made a sudden gesture of remonstrance. For the love of God, let me have it on again. He said hoarsely, I don't think I can stand this much longer. Van Brunt gave the bracelet to Everts, who slipped it over his hand. Immediately, an expression of something like relief came over his face. You don't feel quite so... with it on? asked Van Brunt. No, but it's bad enough anyway. And you? Van Brunt grimaced. As for me, I am handcuffed to a fiend, he said. Everts sat down with the bracelet still on his wrist. Van Brunt, what does it mean? He asked helplessly. Ask me what is on the other side of the moon. You honestly don't know? I can't diagnose the case or cases unless you are crazy, and the microbe has hit me too, for I am as crazy as you are. Everts looked down at the shining green circle on his wrist. I wished I'd let the thing alone, said he. So do I. Suddenly, Van Brunt arose. He was a man of a less sensitive nervous organisation than the other, and his mouth was set hard and even his hands clenched as for a fight. See here, old fellow, he said. We've had enough of this. It's time to put a stop to it. Have you had any dinner? Do you think... began Everts. Well, you've got to eat dinner, whether you want to or not. This is nonsense. Van Brunt struck the call bell on his table violently and his man entered. A look of surprise overspread his face as he looked at his master and Everts, but he said nothing. Tell Hannah if there was any soup left over from dinner to warm it immediately, and send up whatever else was left. Mr Everts has not dined. Tell her to be as quick as possible. Yes, sir, replied the man. And Thomas? Yes, sir. Get a bottle of that old port and open it. Yes, sir. After the man had gone, Everts and Van Brunt sat in a moody silence. Both were pale, and both had expressions of suffering and disgust. 
as if from the contact of some loathsome thing. But Van Brunt still kept his mouth set hard. He even resumed his pipe. It was not long before dinner was announced and he sprang to his feet and laid his hand on Everett's shoulder. Now come, old man, he said. When you've got some good roast beef and old port in your stomach, the mists will leave your brain. The mists are on your brain and you've had good roast beef in your stomach, returned Everett bitterly, but he arose. But I haven't had the old port, said Van Brunt with an attempt at jocularity as the two men entered the dining room. Van Brunt kept Bachelor's Hall, and a neat maid was in attendance. Her master saw her quick glance of amazement at their altered faces. "'You may go, Katie,' said Van Brunt. "'Mr. Everts and I will wait upon ourselves.' After the maid had left, Everts leaned his elbows on the table and bent his head forward with a despairing gesture. "'I can't eat,' he almost moaned. "'You can and will,' replied Van Brunt and ladled out the smoking soup. Everts did eat mechanically, and both men drank of the old port. They sat side by side at the table for the greater convenience of serving. After Everts had finished his dinner, and the two men had dispatched the wine, they looked at each other. Everts gave a glance of horror at the green thing on his wrist. Well, he said with a kind of interrogative bitterness. Van Brunt tried to laugh. Take that confounded thing off and put it out of your mind, he said. You want to wear it yourself, Everts returned almost savagely. Van Brunt laughed. No, I don't. I can stand it, he said. But I'll be hanged if I believe I could suffer much more in hell. The devilish thing is converting me, paradoxically. What does it mean? asked Everts again. Don't know. If it keeps up much longer, I'll try a narcotic for both of us. Not. Everett shuddered. No, not opium, if I know myself. As he spoke, Van Brunt had his eyes fixed upon a spot directly in front of the fireplace, and Everett knew that he saw what he himself saw, the horrible prostrate figure covered with embroideries and the grinning idol. You see it? He gasped. Yes. I do see it, confound it. I'll do something before long. You feel as if, yes, there is something between us. Yes, don't talk about it. I'll do something soon if it keeps up. Everts made a quick gesture. He grasped the table knife beside him. I'll do something now, he cried and made a thrust. Van Brunt's face whitened. Almost simultaneously, he grasped another knife and did the same thing. Then the two men drew long breaths and looked at each other. It's gone, said Everts, and he almost sobbed. Van Brunt was still pale, but he recovered his equilibrium more quickly. What was it? gasped Everts. Oh, what was it? Am I going mad? Going mad? No. There's a reason why I ask. It concerns someone very dear to me. I have not said much about Agnes Leeds to you. In fact... I have not said much to her, but sometimes I think that she... I have thought that I... When my practice was a little better, good God, Van Brunt. I am not mad, am I? That would make marriage impossible for us. You are no more mad than I am, said Van Brunt. He gazed at his friend scrutinizingly. What case have you had on hand now? He asked. The day girls. The murder case, you know. Van Brunt nodded. Just so, you have had that horrible murder thing on your mind and... Say, old fellow, your collar looks somewhat the worse for wear. Yes, my laundress failed me this week, and I have been so horribly busy today that I have not had time to buy some fresh ones before the store closed. Just so, and you wish that there was a Chinese laundry here, I'll be bound. I didn't know, but I did, admitted Everts, with a drawing expression of relief. Then his face fell again. But what of the jade bracelet? He said. He glanced at his wrist and gave a great start. Good God, it's gone! He cried. Of course it is gone, said Van Brunt coolly. It never was there. But you saw it. Thought I saw it, my dear fellow. The whole thing is a clear case of hypnotism. 
something for the psychical research. You are all overwrought with your work, nerves in a devil of a state, and you hypnotised yourself. And then, you hypnotised me. Everts sat staring at Van Brunt with the look of one who is trying to turn a corner of mentality. Then the door was flung open violently and Van Brunt's man rushed in, pale and breathless. Doctor! He gasped. What is it? Oh, Dr. Van Brunt, there's a Chinaman dead right out in the front of the office door. And he's got two stabs in his side, and he's got a green bracelet on his wrist. Dr. Van Brunt turned ashy white. Nonsense, he said. It is so, Doctor. Well, I'll come, said Van Brunt in a voice which he kept steady. You run and get the police, Thomas. Maybe he isn't dead. I'll come. He's stone dead, said the man in a shocked voice as he hurried out. Oh my god, said Everts. If we... if I... killed him. What about Agnes? I can tell quickly enough which of us killed him, said Van Brunt, rising. Both men hurried out of the room. There was already a crowd around the ghastly thing. The police uniforms glittered among them. The fact that the dead Chinaman happened to be in front of his office had no significance for anybody present. There was no question of suspicion for either himself or Everts. Some men held lanterns while Van Brunt examined the dead Chinaman. It was soon done and the body was carried away in an undertaker's wagon, with the crowd in tow. Then Van Brunt and Everts entered the office. Everts looked at his friend and he was as white as the dead man himself. Well, he stammered. Van Brunt laughed and clasped him on the shoulder. It's all right, old man, he said. My knife did the deed. But, stammered Everts, I was on the heart side. What if you were? Your knife went nowhere near the heart. Mine cut the heart clean. I lunged around to the front of the thing, don't you remember? Are you sure? I know it. You can rest easy now. But you, said Everts in a voice from which, for very shame, he tried to suppress the joy. Van Brunt laughed again. It was a poisonous thing, he said. Did you see his face? He shuddered in spite of himself. Men kill snakes of a right, he added. But how do you explain? I don't explain. All you have to consider is that you did not do it. And all I have to consider is that I have set my heel on something which would have bruised it. As he spoke, he was preparing a powder, which he presently handed to Everts. Now, go home, old man, he said. Take a warm bath and this, and go to bed and dream of Agnes Leeds. After Everts was gone, Van Brunt stood still for a moment. His face had suddenly turned ghastly, and all the assumed likeness had vanished. He struck the bell and told his men to bring up another bottle of the old port. When it came, he poured out a glass for himself and gave one to the man. You've got a turn too, Thomas, he said. The man, who was shivering from head to foot, looked at his master. Did you see its face, sir? He whispered. Better put it out of your mind. He looked like a fiend. I doubt if I can ever stop seeing him, said the man. Then he swallowed the wine and went out. Van Brunt settled himself again in his old Morris chair and lit his pipe. He gave a few whiffs and stopped and gazed straight ahead of him with horror. The face of the dead Chinaman was vividly before his eyes again. Thank God he does not know he did it, he whispered, and a good smile came over his great, blonde face. Thank you for listening to the Darkest Page podcast. This has been The Jade Bracelet by Mary Eleanor Wilkins Freeman. This episode was made possible with the support of the librarians of The Darkest Page, Alex Smith and Tonks. I have been your host, and I wish you pleasant dreams. <laughs>